I'm still principal at school, but uh, the kids came to me the, and said, hey, we want to do something at the basketball game. We want to sing Christmas carols when the opposing team shoots free throws. Is that okay? It's like December, you know, so the other team's going to start to shoot free throws and our student section is going to sing jingle bells to try to distract the free throw shooter uh, while they're shooting. I thought that sounded fun. I didn't think there was any. In fact, of all the things our student section could do during a basketball game, that is pretty light and tame and I thought that was great. I thought it would be fun. Didn't think there would be any problems with that. So we do that and I remember our, our opponent that night was Joe Burns high school and there were probably times over the years where the relationships between Nashville Christian and Joe Burns was pretty heated. Uh, they're, they had a really good football team. We had a really good football team. But I remember we got to halftime of the first game and our student section had done that and it was funny and, and it was fun and nothing to it. I remember there was three ladies from Joe Burns who were sitting up on the top row and they called me over. I guess they could tell I was somebody who worked at the school and they called me over at halftime and waved me up to the top row and I, I go speak to these ladies and they said, what is your student section doing? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, they're singing. And I said, they're singing Christmas carols. And they said, well, that is the most unchristian thing I've ever seen a school do. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was unchristian. I'm sorry that you feel that way. So point being, even when you think something's really tame, uh, even when you think something's really obvious that it's kind of fun and all that, people are going to oppose what you do. And uh, so that's going to happen. We're going to talk about that in Nehemiah. And maybe uh, it relates to some of the things that, that we've been uh, facing over the past few weeks. Uh, not Again, not necessarily designed for that purpose, but, but maybe, possibly, we'll hit some of those points. So just a little background um, from a historical side. Uh, this is after the Israelites have been carried off into captivity. The book of Nehemiah is written while they're uh, away. Some groups have returned home, and that's in the book of Ezra. Zerubbabel and Ezra have, have brought groups home. Uh, and the city of Jerusalem and the temple was completely destroyed uh, in 586 B.C. when the final group of Israelites was carried off into captivity uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. And Ezra, when he goes back, he and his people, they rebuilt the temple. Uh, his goal when he went back, he was sent back by the king, and, and what he wanted to do was restore worship and restore Jewish law. He was actually given the task of holding the people that had returned accountable to Jewish law. And so that's what he did, and that's what they did uh, when he returned. That was their focus. But the city itself... And the protective wall that was around it is, is still in rubble and disrepair from, from when it had been destroyed. About 140 years it had passed since 586 B.C. It's about 140 years later, and it is still um, in, in rubble around everywhere you go. So about 12 to 14 years after uh, Ezra restores kind of worship in Jerusalem, Nehemiah comes on the stage. And he has an official role. He is the cupbearer to the king, and the king is Artaxerxes, who's the, the king of the Persian Empire at the time. And this is, this is an important position. Um, the cupbearer of the king is, is someone who is trusted. Uh, you could maybe say in some ways someone who would be a friend uh, to the king, someone who's around the king all the time. When, when governing is happening, the cupbearer is present, and the cupbearer has probably a pretty good education in what it takes to lead people because he sees what the king does on a day-to-day -day basis. In Nehemiah chapter 1, he, being a Jew, uh, inquires of the condition of Jerusalem. And so it's been, again, 12 to 14 years since Ezra uh, went with a, a large group back, and he wants to know how it's going. And so in, in Nehemiah chapter 1, he learns how it's going. So I'm going to read there from Nehemiah 1. It says this, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, 
Those who survive the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Uh, so he talks, they talk about the people first. The people are in great trouble and disgrace. So they're not well protected. They're looked down upon. So that's the state of the people. And then he gives the state of the physical uh, site of Jerusalem, which says it's, the wall is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. So this is what Nehemiah learns about his homeland. Now, Nehemiah has never lived there. It's not like it's his home that he's left, uh, but this is the home of his people. And so he's learned of this and he's very moved by this. And if you, we're, we're going to kind of, hit parts of the first six chapters to get kind of a lesson uh, from all this. So we won't read all of the verses, but if you read the rest of chapter one, much of that is spent with Nehemiah praying for, uh, praying to God and praying what, you know, what do I need to do here and, and forgive our people and be with our people. So he prays, he spends a lot of time in prayer. And then in chapter two, after he spends time in prayer and preparation, um, those thinking about what would need to be done, he speaks to the king and tries to get permission to fix the problem. Now, if I were teaching a different class tonight, one lesson on this would be that Nehemiah saw the problem and wanted to help fix it himself. Like He didn't see the problem and then send other people to fix it. He saw the problem and then chose, I want to take the opportunity to fix it myself. That There'd be a lot... To learn on that. I'm going to read just a few verses from chapter 2 here. Um, this is from uh, verse 4. I'm just going to pick up in verse 4. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, and so I set a time. So he was prepared in advance to answer questions. Uh, he didn't just have a thought and then go to the king and ask. He was, he was well prepared. And he received permission to go back to Jerusalem and, and help them and help those people there. So remember, the people are in, in bad condition. They're in trouble. They're disgraced. And the city itself is in bad condition. The wall is broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. So that's the, that's the problems that he is going back to fix. This is kind of where he is. Susa, I don't know if this laser is laser. Right this is where he is over here speaking to the king. And he's going to go all the way back over here across to Jerusalem. It's not an easy journey. And that's where he's going to go uh, to, to help his people who've gone back to their original homeland there to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And so it's a, it's a long journey. It's not an easy journey. Not much is said about his journey, actually, so it, it must have been uneventful. But this is the verse. Uh, that, remember, this is what he's been told by those who are there. Those who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, there's a problem, and somebody's got to go fix it. Nehemiah's going to go fix it, or he's going to try to go fix it. Um, but there's probably any problem you want to fix, any change you want to make. If you are uh, want to do a, a good work somewhere, there's probably people who don't want you to do that for whatever reason. Um, you know, a, a simple example I, I use of this, if, if you're a coach of an athletic team, you're designing a great game plan and you expect the opposing side to also be designing a game plan to defeat you. And so that pretty much that's the way it is in life. Uh, whatever you're, you're doing that you think is going to be good, there's going to be somebody probably working against you. And so that comes up in, in verse 10 of chapter 2 with the first mention of these two these two men and, and their importance. So it says this, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed 
that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So uh, if, you, if you study these guys, most likely uh, Sanballat is, is a Samaritan, uh, most likely of some importance. Uh, some, some sources say he, he perhaps was a governor of Samaria at the time. And it, it, as you know from reading both the Old and the New Testament, the Samaritans and the Jews are not friendly. And so any, uh, anything that benefits the Jews in Jerusalem is not going to make the Samaritans happy. And so Sanballat and his friend are, are unhappy about this. And they're going to see what they can do to, to stop this. Now they're going to take several different routes to it to try to put a stop to anything being done to help those people. But imagine right now, if they're living in Jerusalem where the, the houses are broken down, the walls are broken down, they, they are not a threat. Um, they are not protected, and anybody who's around them can take advantage of them. And so they are vulnerable to people like Sanballat and Tobiah and others, and um, they, they like it that way. They want them to, to continue to be that way. This is uh, somebody's drawing of what the walls of Jerusalem may have looked like. So if you, up here at the top is where the temple may have been. You can see kind of the shape of the wall as it comes down to a point here and then goes back up and around. This is the wall uh, around the city that, that was in disrepair that Nehemiah and, and those who are with him are, are going to try and rebuild. It, it's up on a hillside so there's some some different terrain that it makes it difficult as well in different places. It kind of talks about that in different places. But this is kind of what it looks like. So the first thing that Nehemiah does when he gets there, um, I, I, think this is, I think this is a great thing that he does, is he takes his own silent walk to survey the scene. Uh, he looks around to see you know, what needs to happen? What is the real condition? How bad is it? Um, you know, what, what do we need to do? And much like you could, you can make that of, of anything, you know, you have to count the cost, right? You have to see what it's gonna take to get the job done first. Uh, he does this on his own. It, it kind of mentions that he does this by night. He goes out uh, with, with no one else and, and kind of looks around uh, and sees the condition of the walls. It's not good. Uh, the verses in chapter 2 talk about how bad it is, talk about places he can't get by. Uh, so the rubble is, is so bad he can't get through. But when he finishes his survey of the area, he's still committed to the goal to, uh, to rebuild the wall. And, you know, again, there's lots of things, uh, you know, a church group of people could decide to do that seemed really hard at the beginning and maybe it's never done because people decide it's too hard to do right there's you know well we could do uh, this great work but it's just too hard and so it, nobody ever starts that work because it's hard uh, building the wall around Jerusalem was not going to be easy but he is committed to starting it and he's committed to doing the work even though it looks very hard. If you go down to verse 17 in chapter 2, uh, this is Nehemiah speaking uh, to the people and this is kind of his, you could say his pregame pep talk I guess to, to encourage them to get ready. So Nehemiah 2 17 says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. I, I like that. He says, Hey, I'm not hiding anything from you. You see the trouble we're in. There's, there's no way to hide it. I'm not going to you know, say it's better than it is. You see the trouble we're in. Then he goes, Come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, Let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. So... Nehemiah speaks to them, encourages them. He says, we're not going to be in disgrace anymore. We're not going to be looked down upon by those around us. We're going to rebuild 
what we have here. And he says, one of the reasons why we're going to do that is because God is with me. Uh, I'm here today because God is with me. And so uh, important, important words for him to kind of get them started. So just watch that. If you, if you read the whole book of Nehemiah and kind of watch through, through the first six chapters, every time there's something that seems encouraging, then there is something that follows that is discouraging. And so right after uh, verse 18, where Nehemiah has made uh, a, a brief speech to the people and says, we're going to build the wall. And they say, yes, we're going to build the wall. Uh, that concludes in verse 18. In verse 19, we pick back up with our enemies. And this time, they have picked up an extra person. Verse 19 says, But when Samballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? So, notice, to this point, no work has been done, right? They've agreed to do the work, but no work has been done. And so the first uh, goal of enemies is to stop the work before it starts. Um, you know, Satan would love for churches to never start a good work. Uh, that would be the best plan, never start. And so any way that they can stop the work from beginning uh, is going to be what they're going to go after. Notice they picked up somebody else. There's, there's probably a lesson in that too that generally anytime there's going to be a conflict uh, there's going to be maybe there's a good side and a bad side and maybe each side gathers all their friends to be on their side. So Sanballat and Tobiah have now added Geshem the Arab. They've added someone else to their group uh, to, to kind of go against them. So maybe these are the surrounding people those who are living in surrounding areas around Jerusalem that are going to try to stop this. Um, you know, again, if we're if we're thinking about some of our recent situations, um, you know, maybe some some complaints begin with one or two people, and then one or two people get on social media or uh, do other things, and they stir up others, and then they have a larger crowd, and then they have more. Uh, that can kind of reach out and uh, you know try to stand with them and stand on their side and stop them. Um, and Nehemiah has lots of choices in how he can answer this. You know, I think that's another thing that's important too. Anytime um, you know people are against you, you can always choose to respond in different ways. And sometimes, if if I'm in those situations, how I respond in my office. When, People are opposing me might be very different than how I respond publicly. I might be frustrated in my office and and angry, but then when I'm responding publicly, I've got to, I've got to manage that. Probably you guys are the same way in your own different struggles, whatever those may be, personally or in your careers or other things. As a Christian, uh, you know, anger or frustration is not forbidden, but how you respond in those moments is important for sure. So verse, verse 20 gives us what Nehemiah answers to them. And this is important for, for a couple of different reasons. He says, I answer them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now the second half of that might be speaking to them as, you guys are not Jews, and this is our place and you're not going to tell us what to do, and you don't have any part in it. And that's certainly significant, uh, especially when he's speaking to the Samaritans who have some Jewish heritage. Um, but the first part is uh, we're going to be successful and we're going to start. He just answers them and says we're going to rebuild. They say you shouldn't rebuild. Now notice I didn't point this out. It's important too. The, the, the last question or the last thing they say uh, the enemy say is are you rebelling against the king so notice they're trying to make them afraid right you know, make somebody afraid to do something they won't do it maybe he'll be afraid of the king afraid that the king won't like what they're doing and so oh, we better not do that the king uh, might be angry with us so they try try different things and how they mock them but Nehemiah says we're going to do that 
and we're going to build. So Nehemiah chapter two, uh, that is kind of where you where you end the story there and kind of how he deals with it. Just simple answers and continuing of the work. Nothing is going to change uh, regardless of what you uh, want us to do. You know, the elders from time to time, whatever they do, um, they have to make decisions that are in the best interest of the church. And sometimes there may be people who are without outside the church who don't like the decisions they make. Sometimes there are people inside the church who don't like some of the decisions that they make. But they are tasked with the responsibility of, in the midst of all of that uh, difficulty, continuing to do the work and continuing to try to do what is right for the church and what is best for the church and what is best for uh, reaching the community and spreading God's word. And that's, that's not always an easy place to be sure it's not always an easy place for Nehemiah to be uh, when he's leading these people and, and coming home in the midst of, of all of this uh, opposition to what he's trying to do. Nehemiah chapter 3, um, I'm, I'm not going to read through that. Uh, one reason I'm not going to read through that is because there are so many names that I would mispronounce there uh, that I would never uh, live that down. They make fun of me when I read names on Sunday mornings and laugh at how I pronounce names, so I definitely am not going to do that tonight. But if you read chapter 3, um, I, I think it's interesting to kind of look at that. All it is, uh, the whole chapter is a list of names and who did what in the building of the wall. Um, we asked the question on Sunday morning, is, is that important for us to know? Like, do I need to know that Eliashib, the high priest, and his priests built the sheep gate. I don't know that I necessarily need to know their names. I don't know that I need to know exactly who built what sections of the wall. Um, however, I, I think it's important to know that it's, it's maybe there for a reason. Um, again, one of the best ways uh, to deal with opposition is to be united in what we do. And I think chapter 3 is a great example of showing how the people were united behind Nehemiah. It wasn't just Nehemiah who, who built the wall. It was it was everybody, and uh, they they are listed by name and by family, and how many people built in certain places. Um, you know, think about. Uh, I feel like I feel like one year, Jeff. One year, I feel like we did a, a list of names of everybody who did anything from BBS and. And maybe talked about the number of people and 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 how they did that. Um, it's important, I think, to to do that sometimes and to see who does what and what part they play and to see that hey, you know, not everything's perfect, but we're all working together. We're all doing this together. If you you can't see this, I know you can't really tell, but if you read the book or excuse me, if you read the chapter chapter three. Um, it lists all of these family names and people, and it and it lists them in order uh, counterclockwise. I think I'm right on that. I always say that backwards when I'm looking at it wrong. Uh, but they start up here at the sheep gate, where the arrow is, and it, and then just the list of names goes around. And the reason you know it goes around is because it says next to, next to, next to, until you get to another gate. And so the the city is marked. By the various gates. So you have the old city gate, you have the sheep gate, the valley gate, you have lots of gates and so it talks about who builds between those sections. And so I'm just going to blow up this one section on the end there where you can kind of see maybe some of the names that are listed that they built side by side and they built the wall together and it says lots of things in there like uh, they built near their home uh, or they built you know where they lived or they helped build near someone else's house it's very specific in all the different list of names there and you know again if we as a congregation or we as a church or we as a group of Christians want to do something that is meaningful and to help the church grow and to teach others and to reach out to those who who are lost then it takes a lot of people to do that 
And it takes people working side by side and it takes people who are willing to work in the middle of opposition to do that. And so um, you get this long list in chapter three. Uh, it is, it's kind of like sometimes the genealogies you read in, in various places in the Bible. It's, it's a pretty boring list of names. There's not a whole lot of extra uh, information there. It's just a long list of names. But I do think it brings out a good point that, you know, if you're ever doing something that's really good and there's a problem, there's opposition to it, then you need to be together. You need to stay together. Um, you know, uh, I, I know I'm the American history line of, or whatever history line, a, a house divided cannot stand or some version of that. Uh, you you got to be united in what you do, and, and everything is important with that. Now, so as we said, the history of or the 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 kind of system of Nehemiah is every time something's positive, it's followed by some negative. Uh, before we read this verse, I just a story from a hundred years ago I, when I was a young counselor at church camp. There were. I was somehow in the the youth minister's cabin. If you don't know what that means, used to you were either a counselor and you were supervising kids, or you were in the youth minister's cabin. There was youth ministers from several other churches there. Um, the first night there was trouble in the boys' teenage cabin, and uh, there was arguments. I think there might have even been a fight, and. That didn't happen very often. There wasn't a lot of trouble at church camp, as you can imagine. Pretty much people are pretty happy to be there, but there was trouble. And, uh, you know, I think it ended up, uh, the youth ministers took a, a group of the boys out and made them run the hillsides, you know, like the typical type punishments you might have for those kinds of things. And there was, I think it was after midnight. It was late at night and doing those kind of things. And we were sitting around. I, we were talking about it, and I remember Joey Spann said, everybody was kind of, you know, flustered and upset and, and disappointed. And I, I think Joey Spann said, um, well, I think this means we're about to have a great camp. And everybody kind of looked at him funny, and he said, he said, well, Satan only attacks when there's something good going on. And uh, I thought that was an, an interesting perspective that I do think about a lot. Uh, you know, it seems like in the midst of things going well, there's always problems, right? There's always problems you have to deal with. It's always difficult. So you can't just celebrate the good things. Uh, there's always going to be opposition, always going to be problems. So even though the building of the wall is going great, uh, there's going to be some problems to deal with. And so, especially for, you know, Bart, especially for elders, you know, that, that's going to happen a lot. So if you feel frustrated by that, that it's probably pretty normal for the job. In the midst of things going well, uh, there's, there's going to be some problems. So chapter 4, right after this big long list of people who are doing great work, we get back to Sanballat. And chapter 4, verse 1 says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, so now the work has begun, right? They tried to stop it before the work began, that didn't work. Now he, he's heard that the building has begun. He became angry and was greatly incensed, and he ridiculed the Jews. Uh, so he's just gonna up the ante, he's gonna just make it worse. You know, when you, when you get started, the problems don't go away. Uh, they, they're gonna probably continue. You're gonna have to figure out a way to withstand that. If you go on to the next couple of verses, verse two says, in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. And so he's talking now to his army. He says, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? If even a fox climbing up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. So now, it's, it's interesting to me that now, instead of ridiculing the Jews and making fun of them to try to make them stop, now they're speaking to their own people and making fun of the Jews to try to get them stirred up. 
right? It's a different tactic. Uh, they're not trying to stop the work. Now they're going to build up their own people to try to go and see if they can do something about it. And so that's going to continue here through chapters 4 and 5 is they're building up their own people to, to stop this work. Um, even, a, even a fox, if he steps on it, the wall will fall down, they say. Uh, but this doesn't, this doesn't stop Nehemiah. And so verse 6 says, we, we, I can't say those words together. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Now, the, I, that's the NIV version. I really like the New King James translation of this better. It says the people had a mind to work. I like that translation. Now, working with all your heart, there's nothing wrong with working with all your heart. I, I just like the translation that they had a mind to work. Um, you know, there's probably times in my life when I don't want to do anything. Maybe Melissa's probably thinking, yeah, you do that every day. You come home, sit on the couch, and watch TV. But there's probably times when I don't want to do anything, um, and probably same for you. There's times when you're tired, um, you need a break, uh, you're sick, you just aren't motivated. Uh, and, and so generally during those times, you don't get a whole lot done. Not, not a lot gets accomplished. But they're in a good moment with the people here. They're in a good moment with those who are working because they have a mind to work. And it's not just one person, it's them, them together. They have a mind to work. Uh, you know, if, if the elders... Uh, decided they wanted to uh, you know, start a new project, a new program, new, we're going to teach uh, you know, young people in our community on Tuesday afternoons. I'm making something up. But let's say they wanted to start that. One of the first things they'd have to do for that to be successful is to have a group of people who had a mind to do that work. They couldn't they couldn't just snap their fingers and make that happen. They'd have to have a group of people at a mind to do that work. Um, you know, there's there's no secret to the fact that there are fewer people here now than there were a few years ago. And so the people who are here, when jobs need to be done, we need to all have a mind to work for those things to be successful. Uh, and there's less, you know, the, the less people are, there are, the more we have to have that dedicated mind to do that. Um, and, you know, most likely the, the Jews are outnumbered by those around them. They were probably in the minority of numbers, uh, but yet they had a mind to do the work. And so, therefore, it continued. If you go on chapter 4, um, things get a little more serious. And now that they've stirred up their own people, they've stirred up the Samaritans, now they're going to think about a physical attack. Now they're going to think about coming after them in battle. So verse 7 says, But when Samballot, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So they're going to fight. Now notice the number of people involved has grown again. So we have Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs. They were already mentioned. But now we've thrown in the men of Ashdod and some others that have joined in. So they've continued to work behind the scenes to build a larger group of people to oppose the work. Um, and that, that's pretty common. Um, you know, if somebody... You know, is going to try to put a stop to something. They're going to continue to try to gather friends to help them do that. Uh, so, anytime you're in the middle of a work, so now we're in the middle of the work, and the opposition hasn't stopped. And so, what you may have to do in these moments is you've got to adjust somehow. You've got to make some sort of adjustment. You've got to change what you're doing. You've got to respond uh, to those who are opposing you. And so Nehemiah, the verses of Nehemiah talk about that, uh, and they continue building. So one, the work has to continue, and two, we've got to make some changes. We've got to respond to these people who may come and make a physical attack. And so Nehemiah sets out a group of men to be on the watch. Uh, and there's, here in 
we won't read all of chapter four, but some of the verses talk about, you know, they, they have a, a, a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other because they're doing the work on the wall, but also prepared for battle. And so you have to be uh, continually adjusting that. Uh, there's, there's also a little bit of fear. Um, you know, things get more serious. Um, some people get afraid. Some people get worried. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of the goal sometimes of people who are in opposition is they want you to be afraid. Verse 10 and 11, basically, I'm not going to read those verses, but basically they, they, they ask, hey, are, are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to continue this? In verse 10 and 11, they're, they're not sure that they can continue this. But moving on to, uh, down just a little bit, let's, let's read verse 14, because this is where Nehemiah is responding again. And he's going to speak to his people and he's going to encourage them in verse 14, where he says, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Um, so two things, he brings it back to God, right? God is with us, that's important, that's the most important thing, but then he also brings it back to them personally. It's a personal thing for you. It's about your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. It's personal and it's about God, both. Um, and so any, any work that we do is that's, you know, for the church in particular, think about that. It's, we're doing work for God, but it's also personally, it's about us. You know, anything, you know, I think of Kidspiration when I do work in Kidspiration, it's partly about my children, right? And my children and what they're taught and those kind of things. And when we do work, uh, here, we want it to be that way. We want it to be a personal motivation for it. So going on down to 16, it says, uh, this is just kind of the, the adjustments that they made. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials and did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. So they're always on the ready. Uh, they're always prepared. You know, it's not like we're going to go into battle in our neighborhood over things. We're not going into battle. We don't need weapons, but we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared for whatever attack may come and prepared to withstand that. Uh, and they were, and they were, they continually did that. Uh, and so that, I think, similar in verse 21 to what we read in verse 17. Uh, half the men were holding spears while the other half did the work. And they did this uh, all day long in shifts. So the work continues. Now, I'm getting close to out of time here, so I'm going to have to rush through the last part. I never know how many slides to use here. I'll be honest, on Sunday mornings, I use about six slides uh, in a lesson, and we talk and have discussion. I think I have 23 slides here tonight, so it's a little bit different for me. But uh, if you read the first part of Chapter 6, uh, the work has continued. Uh, things are going well, and again, we hear Sanballat and Tobiah are frustrated. Uh, we're, we're getting right to the conclusion here, so we'll kind of look at a couple of verses here. It says, When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono but they were scheming to harm me. And so uh, their next attack, now that the wall is built, they want to just get Nehemiah. They want to take Nehemiah out. Obviously, he's the problem. We're going to take him out. Um, but he doesn't come. I want to get to this verse. This is, oh, I don't know what happened, Greg. I clicked about eight times, apparently. You go back to the one that's it's down towards the end, Nehemiah 6, 3 through 4. Can you find that one for me? Oh, right there. You're great. Right there, perfect. You're awesome. You're really good at your job. Okay, um, so th I love this verse, and and I, you know, this is a this. There's probably a, a great sermon in this somewhere. Um, this is how he answers them, and he says, "I am carrying on a great. This is NIV. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop 
while I leave it and go down to you. Now again, I like the New King James Version better. It just, it just says, I'm doing a great work and cannot come down. I can't stop doing a great work. Um, if you're doing a great work, keep doing it. You know, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. If you're doing a great work for the church, it's, it's vital, it's crucial that you continue to do that. And don't be distracted. Uh, don't be distracted from what you're doing no matter what, the, uh, no matter what those distractions are. Um, so here's verse 15 is essentially the conclusion of the building of the wall it took 52 days uh, I don't know if that's you know as long as they expected or shorter than they expected but the work is completed that is the key the work is completed uh, and amidst all of the distractions they are able to do this and this is a great verse too when all of our enemies heard about this all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence um, they lost any desire to come and attack because the wall was completed. Um, you know, I, I don't know what non-Christians, what stops non-Christians from trying to stop Christians. You know, a lot of times uh, we talk about uh, showing them love and so that they, they realize there's good things here um, and maybe they're going to leave us alone and not try to stop us. Sometimes it seems like they never stop. But if we keep doing things the right way, um, eventually those who are our enemies and try to attack us will stop. And we complete the work and we do the work that needs to be done. So I just put a few little bullet points here at the end. No matter what you're doing, uh, especially when you're doing things for God as a Christian, for the church, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be uh, people who don't appreciate that. Everybody has to work together. You have to make adjustments and continue the work. My two favorites are this one. Everybody has to have a mind to work. Um, it's not for others to do. Everybody has to have a mind to work. And don't come down from doing the work. Um, and so I think all of those things just are, are good, good points in what, we, what we're doing here at the church and, and even as a personal Christian in our own daily life. So. I know I'm a little bit over time, I think. Sorry about that. I was following Josh's example for his uh, sermons. He's been a little over time lately, too. So. Uh, but, uh, again, I appreciate you guys uh, let me do this. Hope I wasn't too boring, and uh, let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we can uh, be, to your, be together here and, and study your word, and we just ask that you would uh, bless our time together and bless us as we go about our daily lives that that we will always seek opportunities to serve you. We pray for those who are traveling, that you would bring them home safely. We pray for those who are sick and that you would bring them back to us. And we're grateful most of all for the, for the forgiveness that's provided through Jesus and his death on the cross. And we ask all this in his name. Amen.